Right, everyone, welcome. And my name is Majid. I'm live at Four Seasons Landscaping. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome everybody for our wonderful session. And for those of you not familiar with this program, it's called New Politics and Afrofuturisms, which we are basically calling for black radical imagination and pop culture as powerful vehicles for propelling progressive social justice narratives to mainstream audiences with a specific focus on Afrofuturism, black activism, arts and culture, climate, as well as political theory and practice. And for those not familiar with the University of the Underground, it is a free, pluralistic and transnational university, which is based in the basement of nightclubs in Amsterdam. But as you can tell, and due to current events of this pandemic, we are all online. The title of this wonderful and lecture talk is called Failed Developments by Foreign Systems. And it truly is a great honor and a privilege to introduce our wonderful educator, teacher, and her name is Renata and Russo Dixon. And she's, <laughs> she is a London-based multidisciplinary design studio with a focus on interior and architectural design solutions for the commercial construction industry and, and private clients. And her projects are spread across the UK, US, Africa, and the Middle East, with a keen interest in exploring more opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa. With this in mind, the studio and that she's involved in really offers a consultancy that supports and guides people through the pitfalls of setting up a business or product for the commercial interior design industry, whether that be in Africa, and just connecting the diaspora to Africa. Renata, thank you so much for joining us and willing to share your wisdom with us and you are most welcome and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Renata Dixon Nwosu and I will just uh, start sharing my screen. Let's see. So, a uh, little bit about me. First of all, if I can get things to work. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about me, setting up the scene and then speaking about Damscape. And um, with me, I like to call myself as an all round creative. Um, I'm an explorer, I love beautiful things. I love to see how our culture intersects um, art, design, technology, um, and future forecasting. And so with that being the case, I like to get really um, stuck in into questions or notions or ideas that sometimes may not be everyone's um, cup of tea, but I like to explore these spaces because obviously as a black woman, um, I'm consistently in uncomfortable spaces in relation to who I am, where I'm supposed to be and how I'm supposed to be seen by the world or how I'm supposed to interact by the world or with the world. Um, and so I would like to talk about the current economy and look at it from a perspective of if, for instance, COVID was a movie, what would we be seeing and how does that look in relationship to the existing 1% and how they've set up their paradigms. Um, sorry, just give me a minute. Sorry. Is it? No, back looking at the chickens. Something seems to be wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with those chickens, Mitch. 
That's the damnest thing I ever saw. I don't know. It seemed to swoop down at you deliberately. Birds are not aggressive creatures, miss. They bring beauty into the world. It is mankind, rather, who insists upon making it difficult for life to exist upon this planet. I mean, birds just don't go around attacking people without no reason. You know what I mean? I think we're in real trouble. Huh? I don't know how they started or why, but I know it's here and we'd be crazy to ignore it. To ignore what? The bird war? Yes, the bird war. The bird attack. Play. Call it what you like. They're messing up there someplace and they'll be back. You can count on it. Are you guys still seeing my screen? No, we just see yes. the video at the moment. Sorry, pardon? We just saw the video at the moment. Okay, so because it's blank on I my side. I keep telling you, this oh, isn't a few birds. These are gulls, crows, swifts. I have never known birds of different species to flock together. The very concept is unimaginable. Why, if that happened, we wouldn't have a chance. Is this supposed to be a black screen? I think that's it. Can you guys see that? Or? Oh, here we go. It's not again. There we go. What happened? Um, the screen went blank. Um, I think it's because you have a, quite a few browser windows open. <laughs> Why you gotta add on like that? I mean, like, <laughs> like for real though. Okay, we're doing it on the fly, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay um if i could just quickly get back to my screen um yeah i don't think try not putting the video on full screen like instead of like that way yeah. like that. yeah that's probably a better option Where's that? Thus set the Lord God into the mountains and the hills and the rivers and the valleys. Behold, I, even I, shall bring a sword upon you, and I will devastate your high places. So I thought that was um, quite poignant, considering um, that 2020 is the gift that just consistently keeps on giving. Um, and what that tends to now question for me is what does that look for the one percent in terms of their investments in terms of how they wanted to work with with economies in Africa and how they um seem to want to be present in trying to assist us but with COVID happening I think that this now means it's almost that every man for himself and so with the economy and with the news we start seeing um these notions of what is called um a great reset and i think it's prominent to um look at the fact that in examples of projects of this so-called great reset of helping africa helping um, give facilities and infrastructure to um, the local communities. We can just take an example of the uh, couple of projects that I've just put up on the screen. And so we have the, can you see it? Yeah, we can see the text on the screen. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, so you have uh, Chad Cameron oil pipeline to the Atlantic Ocean that costs 4.2 billion pounds. Um, and it was the biggest pipeline project in Africa um, when it was completed in 2003. But um, the government announced in 2005 that the, un the money would go towards a general bu uh, budget and purchase of weapons or else oil companies would be expelled. We go to uh, the fishing plant in Kenya. It was worth 22 million. The project was designed in 1971 to provide jobs to the people of the local community. However, the Tokuran um, nomads are known for eating and fishing within that area. And so the plant um, was quickly shut down as it co caused um, local uh, ecology issues within that area and still remains to be the white elephant in Kenya's arid northwest. Um, we then move forward to what that looks like in 2020 in regards to failed projects and what 
could be happening around the world in terms of us coming together as a collective. Just uh, bear with me. So I thought this news article was quite poignant. Now is the historical moment, the time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system. We have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. It is an opportunity we have never had before and may never have again. So we must use all the levers we have at our disposal, knowing that each and every one of us has a vital role to play. Now is the time to think what history would say about this crisis. And now is the time for all of us to define our own role. What is it that would make it so that history would look at this crisis as the great opportunity for reset? The Great Reset is a welcome recognition that this human tragedy must be a wake-up call. It is imperative that we reimagine, rebuild, redesign, reinvigorate and rebalance our world. Rebalancing investment, harnessing science and technology, and advancing the transition to net zero emissions, all elements of the Great Reset are fundamental to building the future we need. The world's problem. I think it's really interesting that they uh, are consistently talking about this great reset and let's learn from our previous mistakes and things that have happened in the past but yet um, we go to um, the Niger Basin where my project was based in um, as a relationship to looking at what was happening in the local community within the area and looking at the failed projects and I began to um, notice that this seems to be the same um, narrative it's uh, almost like a rinse and repeat we have a problem we need to fix it we have people that can help and here's all the money that can go towards it but um, in the end it becomes um, something that becomes corrupt and doesn't help the local community and so in terms of superpowers and um, superstructures and their influences on Africa and the Niger Basin itself. We look at um, the Niger Basin, which is made up of 15 different countries as in terms of the Niger River completely cutting through all these um, 15 different countries. And so in a, in a strategic bid to look at this site, that river is a complete vein that would um, supply every single community and what happens upstream definitely affects what happens the communities downstream and um, in relationship to how the communities would then interact um, within uh, the waterfront of these areas uh, are also impacted and previously we talked we saw that in the, in the video that I showed previously that um, they were talking about nomadic communities that would uh, travel through the areas and how they were impacted by um, the oil uh, disasters within that area. And similarly, um, when I decided to base uh, my project within Mali, within the Niger Basin, I thought that it was um, poignant because the Tarug um, nomadic communities also intersect within these um, larger communities within um, the 15 different countries. And so when we start looking at the examples of failed projects, we have a whole timeline um, and local ecology um, breakdown that is probably very wide and you can't see it properly, but I'll give a brief um, explanation. So all these projects down here began to just break down who in relationship to the World Bank, the governing bodies, um, the local community NGOs, um, the Western NGOs, and how they all impacted to provide services and infrastructure within this Niger Basin, basin um, space where everything is about water, food and energy for those local communities. Um, and I began to find, find that, you know, they just weren't cutting it. They weren't cutting it because um, they were very much top heavy and when we take it back to where we are today, those structures of things being top heavy are beginning to crumble all over again. And I almost feel that we are being um, 
faced with questions of then saying, how do we um, redevelop this when the normal uh, superstructures and superpowers are becoming um, obsolete? And as a sort of stepping motion forward, we then look at the timeline, for instance, in um, the democracy of uh, Mali. And if you see from the 11th century all the way up until um, 2013, where there was um, French intervention, there has always been um, civil unrest within this community. And we always have um, the different democracies and governments that would always come in to support the community, but somehow end up uh, failing um, disastrously. And so when we start looking at that, I took into consideration that the issues we were having was, again, relating back to water, again, relating back to energy but, um, and supply. And so I then had to zoom in further into Mali and look at local communities that would then be impacted by the rainfall and um, the sunlight of this Niger Basin area, as well as um, what the structures that had been impacted or built within these areas then um, had as a play on the community. Um, and so, as you can see, uh, one hectare of, of land would be the equivalent of uh, 36,767 um, square meter of population for the indigenous um, communities. And during uh, the rainy season, these areas then become flooded and these communities that live within these so-called mini islands um, across the basin then become impacted to a point that um, they have to move away and they can no longer live within the community. Um, and when I started looking at how um, I could propose a new system of looking at things, um, whereas uh, by looking at these failed structures and saying, okay, how do we take the budgets and the funding that's completely available and is happily shared um, into these communities, how do we then actually make it work for the communities? So taking those uh, components um, as uh, notions to apply solutions to, water harvesting technologies um, are categorized into groups of various ways, depending on what aspect criteria or water harvesting is emphasized. And this is based on agroclimatic uh, zones, hydroclimatic zones and um, catchment areas. And so while looking at Mali, we know that for instance, we would need to be able to supply them with um, fully irrigated water that we could then have them use to supply for their food, to deal with their drainage, to deal with local energy supplies. And so I began to look at um, the collection and management of flood water and rainwater within that area. And so I also began to look at really traditional ways of doing it because um, it seems as though whenever we um, have the Western influences or influences where a whole team can come into said country and provide a solution. Um, once those people leave, the exchange of education is not necessarily given to the local community. So these things then tend to fall um, by the wayside and become lost budgets of money and um, infrastructure for the community. So for me, it was really important to be able to introduce um, easy, ways of um, integrating tools within a system um, or a typology that the local community could then use as a way of um, meeting their needs. So in terms of meeting their farming needs, we would then look into retention ditches, um, external water catchments, as well as um, planting pits. And so I then took a step back and then went back into looking at habitable or inhabitable step wells and channeling water and what those Johads used to do um, in, in the old days where we were just using ancient structures to collect water um, and to build our local communities and power our, our environments. 
And so I then said to myself, what's the potential for the status of, of rainwater collecting and, har um, and harvesting in, in Mali? And are these budgets that we are being given, um, can we then somehow rewrite uh, the potential, the application of um, collecting these funds for these said projects? And so um, in 2008, the Malian government adopted a plan of um, harvesting water. And in 2012, the initiative um, was defined as a program um, that would harvest between 2012 and 2016. But um, despite the potential need for local appropriateness, improved water harvesting has not been on a high development agenda. And I can completely imagine that still till today, it's not been on a high um, agenda and it's just a problem that we consistently have and then we maybe get budgets for it. But um, in terms of me trying to look at it from a bottom up um, initiative, it was taking the communities and developments that, um, that I had looked at um, that were nomadic in, in nature and looking as to how the waterway now becomes um, a vein and the equivalent of a ribbon development that we would have in, um, for instance, the UK, where we just have um, hardscape as opposed to water courseways. Um, and so uh, I began to fully um, start extrapolating it in relation to the family structure in their agricultural um, production systems, how the extended family and the nuclear family worked within these communities, how that would then replicate itself and expand within um, collective community farming um, plots and private plots, and how the community as a whole now creates this ecological um, relationship where the farmers and the fish the, the fishery um the fishery states and the people that do make all the production for the wares now become a cohesive network of people uh, providing for that said local community um things that um we needed to expand on was you know how do they fish what is the aspects of collecting water what are the um statistics and things that they require because um generally a lot of these statistics tend to come from you know organizations that have a large bed of data but again when it comes down to it being within the local community and how that affects them it tends to be very much top heavy and so um it became um for me a thing about education and learning and using vernacular architecture to tackle the said um failed systems in a way that the local community can then recognize to be their own and then hopefully allow them to be able to replicate over a period of time and so the sort of um the master plan that i then proposed was a fully integrated and amphibi amphibious um landscape which i called um damscape which would replace the original dams that would only produce a certain level of water and would not actually um, meet the community's needs. And so within these grid um, breakup, you have the academic districts that run all the way through um, the, the proposal. And then you have family um, locations and educational um, locations on the outs outskirts. So you would have these water collection pots, which actually, um, when it would rain and this top level became amphibious they would now be able to collect and store their water underneath um, the water well that i then created which on the top surface would come through as um, like a, a water causeway that becomes something beautiful um, and then we then have uh, the family um, designated living areas, a water purification plant. Um, and then we had within here, these sort of testing soil beds here, here and here. And so all these areas for me um, was almost like a science kit that you could roll out within uh, the Malian um, community and similarly across all the communities or countries 
across um, the Niger Basin and use this as a toolkit to basically approach the things that they needed within their community that needed to be targeted um, efficiently. So similarly, this could be a thing of light. It could just now be a landscape that works with uh, water and um, sunlight and then becomes uh, a, an electricity creating component as opposed to it being water, food, soil sampling. And what would then happen is that when uh, governments uh, and organizations like um, WHO or the NGOs that would come through, rather than then getting their sources from people who don't necessarily understand the culture, who don't necessarily understand the community, these community setups would then be able to provide an, um, the research needed for these governments to be able to maybe, since they do want to continuously um, give funding to loads of different projects and they do want to help, start helping in a way that is more cohesive and collective and harmonious to the community. Um, and so uh, in a static position, position, you see that it sits within um, the foundations of the basin that I had carved out. And then we go, as it rises, we get to maximum water level where um, it almost becomes a Noah's Ark for the amount of time um, that they would be displaced from their uh, villages or communities during the rainy season. Um, and then this was, me taking examples of the, the ways in which they lived in terms of um, the, the natural straw and the communities in terms of the hierarchy of the spaces and sort of creating these environments and speculating that this is what we could have provided um, based off of um, offering a, seeing a problem and offering a solution. Um, do you guys have any questions? I know I may have run through that pretty quickly. <laughs> no, thank you so much um, for that, Ronald. I really appreciate it. And um, has anyone got any questions? I have so many. <laughs> can I ask a question, Chris, just to start things off? Sure. Um, I was wondering, can you go back to your, um, was, there, was, there, was there another Adam that you were going to discuss after this or can we go back a bit? No, we can go back a bit. Um, you spoke about the, um, the idea of foreign, foreign handprints in, 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 in foreign nations, basically, people mm. coming in and doing work. In this context, you use the pronouns we and they a lot. Um, yeah. And I just want, if you possibly, if you can clarify who we're talking about when you say we and they, and then link towards when you say vernacular, um, architectural vernacular or vernacular architecture, um, what did you see specifically? And if you can zoom in a little bit on those slides, um, just so we can see in detail, what are we, what are the things that you identified um, in those spaces and how do they relate to the specific kingdoms and, uh, and um, cultures that existed there. Okay, let's take, so the we and the they. Mm. The we and the they is for me, when I started this project, basically, um, it had become very, what's the word? It was a space in which I was trying to really understand what is my offering as um, a black um, architect or interior designer that, you know, you spend seven years trying to um, do this thing. And then you maybe have, I don't know, 30, 40 years, maybe 50 if you're lucky um, of good employment. And, and then what's your offering? And so I just felt that I had to get an understanding of what, the, the dichotomy and the dynamics of the communities I was dealing with were. And to almost check myself because um, yes, I'm a black female, yes, I'm based in London, but my heritage is Nigeria, but, and also Igbo. And so these are a lot of spaces that I occupy that I could speak to, but then um, I think coming in as a Western, um, or someone that lives here in the UK, going back to Africa, or going back to um, going back to Africa, or going back to even Nigeria, and then proposing uh, some sort of ideal 
mm-hmm. is almost um, colonialist in its mindset, i.e. I don't necessarily understand the everyday runnings of that community. And mm-hmm. so however I'm going to um, propose this without understanding who the community is, um, I cut myself off. So when I then present to um, people or stakeholders about these projects, it does become a we and them or a we, a them and us. Because now um, from a business perspective, you have a client who is trying to sell a service. Right. And you have a collective of people that um, are investors. And so sometimes, majority of the times, those investors are only caring about the bottom line. It, it doesn't come down to what the everyday person is going to um, deal with. And so, for instance, the everyday person within, within the Taruk community would be those people that have to go and, and fish um, in the mornings, or, or you know, they don't know how they're gonna feed their families for the next farming cycle because they don't have enough information and background research to be able to support that. So in terms of creating this testing bed of, of a damscape, it would take soil samples from different communities and put them in scientific um, test beds to say, can you actually farm next year? Mm. Uh, is the soil, does the soil have enough content for you to farm next year? And right. if it can't, what are the neighboring communities that do have those um, conducive soil environments for whether it's millets, whether it's maize, the things that your community now needs? And so when you start looking at a place like Mali or the different communities and, and tackling um, what their needs are in, in, in terms of what production they would then need to, for the next year, you can then actually create it as an us and go to your different, you know, the different countries next door and say, okay, so what have you guys done this year? How's, what's the st- statistics on that? Can we uh, collaboratively use some of your soil space to create what we need here and generate an economy? And that's the it's almost um, from the everyday man up. Whereas the political structures and, and um, the NGOs to an extent, I don't believe that they mean to be like this, but if you haven't walked a day in someone's life or really understood their, their organization of space. So for instance, um, if we go back to, I don't know if I'll be able to zoom in, but, Within, um, for instance, uh, maybe let me stop sharing and then try to fix that. The reason, um, just to give a context while um, you bring that up, is that the project that all of the researchers are taking part in at the moment um, is about starting to create some kind of visual visualization articulation of what it looks like for humanity and the and the environment to thrive simultaneously Mm -hmm. and what i was what i'm thinking about is how you can't come up with how what what it's like to try and come up with a solution that goes across cultures across spaces and how that is negotiated um, because you can't I find it very difficult to say hey this problem or this solution will solve everybody's problem but what it requires you to do is to remove space that may have been ritualistic for you or um, and not just in terms of religion but maybe just in day-to-day habits so um, how do you start that conversation of under- of integrating a solution with uh, with consciousness to people's rituals and then um, Dee had a question as well Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to answer Chris's question first, or yes, um, I think this uh, just with me zooming in. I think the unique what how I approached this was um, to break things things down into components. Um, what are the running um, narratives and components that each community um, needs that they can find common ground in? Um, and give them an identification or um, relationship to them. And so, for instance, architecturally speaking, 
um, they would, we had this level of vernacular, almost like Fibonacci self-replicating villages that have always happened across history and across settlements. And so when we start looking at those um, settlements and how they build up, um, you start understanding the hierarchy of space. So there would always be a function and an education within these spaces um, in regards to their cultural uses. And this could then be broken down into, um, there it is, I think this was a good example, you know, what their worldview started to break down with. So you have an ontological worldview, which is then broken down into layers of internal values and beliefs, which is then segmented by intermediary layers and then externalized by cultural representations. And this then now breaks down into law, legislation, literature, architecture. And so my, my um, initiative was to sort of sew this all in together and, and, and make it almost like um, a flat pack for each community. So for the Malian community within this area, the key factors were education as the basis of everything, as a, the basis of transfer, uh, a transferring of skills. Um, and then after the educational standpoint, you then empower them by allowing them to understand their environment and, and, and their needs and the harshness of, of their environment and then build up um, tools that can be applied to said environments. Um, I think that's pretty much the only way you could do it um, singularly, and then you almost connect them up as input, um, input output in relation to which, what each community needs and how they want to collaborate as um, stakeholders. Cool. Dee, do you want to ask your question? I think you've got two now, so you're going to jump in and go for both. Yeah, um, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. There's um, a cost and time and financial resources in being intentional and culturally sensitive. And I agree that this approach is absolutely critical. Um, how do, were you able to justify it for those who are more concerned with the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is um, you maybe have a 2.2 billion pound budget that you said you were going to have, I don't know, let's call it 50% output and you're getting 20. What, that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense. You could recall it back through your insurance, but um, what's the point of giving out money like that to only have to then um, claim insurance on it and, and write it off? Wouldn't it be um, a better notion um, if I used a carpentry um, application to cut twice and measure, cut twice, measure once and cut twice? Yeah, and measuring once, I mean, to collate this project for me, it, it literally did take a whole year worth of looking at the different, um, um, dynamics and the needs and the steer um, the 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 stakeholders and what their demands were, and then looking at different scenarios and solutions that actually met everybody's um, requirements, but without making it um, the one percent as in top heavy, uh, sort of like taking their brief and weaving it back in from um, the grassroots. So it's literally an ability to take their brief. I know what you want, I hear what you want, I see what you want. Um, this is what you can have if you maybe looked at it like this, because the notion that you want and the output that you, you have historically gives you failed projects all over the world that we now have continuous architects saying, or articles that consistently say, okay, whose fault is it? Well, the fault is, is the lack of um, sensitivity and planning right at the beginning of it. And yeah. Thanks for that. You really put in the terms that they can understand. Uh, I have another question is that you're an expert in your field and a field that has um, a technical jargon associated with it. Can you elaborate on how you're able to minimize this, uh, your profession's vernacular? Because I work in data and I'm, I'm often very wonky and have a hard time explaining data and research even um, to the people I, I work with directly and the communities I work with. 
Um, really good visuals. Now I say that, and in my mind, I'm assuming that I've given you a good presentation with good visuals. <laughs> um, but um, it has, I think, an idea needs to be able to capture the minds of people straight away. I think when we look at um, ourselves as designers, um, they always say a picture says um, tells a, th a thousand words. And it's the ability that we have always been visual creatures, whether you want to call it vernacular. And I use the word vernacular um, it, as a pet peeve, and also as this is like the industry terminology for all things um, African um, or traditional that isn't techie from the Western world. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Does anybody get any other questions at all? Felix. Hi. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for the great presentation. I think it's very in depth. Um, just have so many questions, really, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, who who is in your team? Like, what's the structure? Because it's a quite a big project, and then I'm I'm just trying to grasp an idea of is it like tens? Is it in the twenties? Is it you? Is it just you? You're, you're just going out there and building it, like building everything yourself. And... Um. So this was my my baby. <laughs> mm. um, and it was my baby for me to understand the, the intricacies of it, you know. Um, this is the breakdown of however thousands of iterations of, okay, so if I want to do this presentation of, um, let's go for instance, let's do this. If I want to explain this presentation of what's the facts and figures of, um, that I need for this, for, for water and energy? Um, how do I explain this? How am I gonna be able to tell people the story and narrative in a way that they understand that is then feasible for them to be able to then say, okay, these are the areas that we're working in. I just had to understand what I was dealing with. And basically it's quite a beast Absolutely. in terms of um, the information. And yeah. it took me a while to, to really distill if we really go through it. And it's just like, well, how do I get all these, these key people? Um, how do I explain that to everybody and yeah. get them in a space that they understand it and they can run forward? I yeah. couldn't, not, not initially, I had to understand it myself. But then um, it now allows me or gives me the space to be able to propose um, these ideals to people because, yeah. you know, I've wrestled with, you know, for instance, this map, this is a very simple map, but the, the, the initial map was, okay, so what's the soil? What's, you know, the, the, the soil here is very different from the soil here. Okay, how is that gonna impact on what I do here? Mm -hmm. And so almost having to negotiate and collaborate with that it was a, a consistent slipstream. And so yeah. it then became, okay, if, I've, if, this is, if this is what I've proposed in Mali and me going to Nigeria, how was I gonna propose that in Nigeria? I had all these great ideas. I had all the foundations, but what I was shown when I went to Nigeria was it's a completely different environment. Yeah, so, so for me, like if you go back to the one with the rainfall, like, um, I guess I'm asking because like, if you're if you're doing all the research, you're doing all the visual production, mm. you know, you're distilling it, you're going out there in the studies. It's just like that is super impressive. Can I just say, um, first of all, like you're, you're killing as a graphics designer as well as as all the other top level things. But uh, like the one that I want to kind of touch on is that there's one if you scroll up a bit for a few pages above, which is about the water, the sunshine, the waterfall and uh, wow. it's like on the left side yeah so that one was pretty impressive because i think it's like it takes a lot of different industry data and oh, then yeah. you're able to compile it in in such a way which is like yeah you know you can you can you can display it quickly and this is how it impacts this is the result you know and then you're and then on this right side you i think you're you're labeling certain differences in the in the in the, in the regions lands and stuff so definitely like 
like you know artistic creative like data like like it's just great i think um so i guess yeah i'm, just, I'm still just like how you've made all these visuals as well as done the technical report um and i guess the, the final question would actually be like what techniques did you use to listen and study the needs of the locals because like was it human-centered design kind of like how did you listen how did you propose the questions how did you get out there and, and gather? Um, so something that my 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 mum did for us that was really beneficial and has now put me, it's now how I work. Um, and so uh, there's all these, in any culture, there's these notions of learning by looking. We're always socialized or grown into a community or collective by understanding what the social hierarchy and dichotomy is. Um, and so, for instance, my first thesis when I looked at Igbo architecture, I was, there, there was a difference between, I'm now studying my, cult, my culture from the perspective of um, a researcher, as opposed to someone who has this lived experience. And my lived experience and what I was reading in certain books was very, um, contrasting and really hard to to take on board for instance um there was um a letter list written by lord lugard to the queen these documents are available on like the national archive or whatnot but it was talking about the Igbo community and how they're such a happy and jovial people and you know they'd be they, they, they seem to have a, a semblance of security and safety because we never, we never closed and locked our doors. A notion that in, when I went to America and I um, was staying with family, in certain areas, they still don't lock their doors. But here in London, the front door is three locks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so to, to, to see that and then the conclusion of his um, sort of tour of the Igbo community was, you know, because we had an understanding of, of people as individuals and collectives, and we had an understanding of religion that, you know, it would be really, um, we would absorb and we would assimilate um, the religious um, classes into a, 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 a point that was about to be implemented within that community. And so, for me, that was hard to hear. That was hard to hear that these are three or four generations back where we would have been doing our own thing. And mm -hmm. then other people come in and explore us and have an idea and then come back and take this information, write it in books, publish it in books. Yeah. And it's not the real story, fam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, it's, it's real distressing to, to me. So with that being the case of me feeling that as Nigerian born, Igbo heritage, British living black woman, yeah. I'm not gonna come to be like, I really wanna understand like how you make that weave, like what's your <laughs> ideals behind how you make that weave? Uh. Those symbologies that I'm gonna take as nonsense because within my dichotomy, within my environment, I don't recognize that as anything. Do, do you get what I'm saying? It's like mm. a it's like going up to Scotland and, and seeing a road sign in Gaelic. Well, clearly yeah. you're going to ignore it because you don't understand Gaelic. Yeah, so yeah. it's that ability of sitting with people, really trying to understand them and understand what their needs are is the only way. And I think it's great that we always talk about it, but um, this is me coming from a, uh, uh, a standpoint of doing therapy for myself a lot of it is very egotistical ignorance mm -hmm. and, and lack of care and lack of time to even want to understand somebody else's culture. And then, and then you wanna, okay, so I've kind of spent maybe, I don't know, 50%, 50, 50, 50 days with you. Let's just say I spent 50 days with you. There's things that I don't understand, but because I don't understand them, um, I'm gonna write them off because they don't, they don't mean anything. And then I'm yeah. going to write my own stuff and I'm never going to sit with you guys and say, so this is my understanding of how your culture works. Um, this is where I'm coming from. Is it, is it colonialist to think that if I make this assumption that this is, this is something that is relative to you or 
because I haven't understood it properly. I think there's a, a, a consistent need to question our motives yeah. to but, wanting to support whoever it is. What is your motive? And do you want, I think if we all care enough to want to be able to have, I want to live in a world where I'm seen, I'm visible and, and my culture is respected. Mm. So I need to do that for other people. So you didn't actually go in with like this preset kind of uh, 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 trained ways of questioning. No. Interviewing. You, you no. just went in and just like, just genuinely just like eye to eye, like what's going on, sat down, tell me your story kind of thing. Yeah, because like Igbo, stuff, books on Igbo culture, people like my dad, who is like within the community, he's seen as like, someone who retains all the history and culture and so they will people will call him and be like is this the way to do things and he'd be like maybe do it this way da, 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 da. Mm. you have to come across like that so when I'm bringing books to him and I'm like oh dad yeah yeah Igbo culture here you go <laughs> he's reading, what is he reading he'll read something like and the Igbo people um they're obu and their centralized living room meant, and my dad is like, these people are lying. That's not what we do. So if that's my dad's frustration. Jeez, okay. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, yeah. my lived culture is going to be distilled by somebody else, yeah. not necessarily lived or understood and then published. Yeah. And then you're going to make money on it. Yeah. And then this is now what, two, three generations are now going to pick up whether accident whether mistakenly whether it doesn't matter everyone has the right to publish mm. and then take that as the norm mm. can't be right in my history or pro, pro, um proposing how i live without understanding me and it's not a quick solution it, it just isn't we've done the quick solutions and we keep coming up against the same thing yeah because because I guess like the techniques I was taught was like human centered design where you kind of you go in with a blank slate, you ask questions, you create personas coming from that. And in some in some way, like you've naturally just been able to just like, yeah, cool. Here's that. Here's that. You've listened very well and you formulated it. So, yeah, well done. Like, amazing. Just just get to know people. Just yeah. watch. So, for instance, yeah. my dad would take me to Nigerian parties with we'd all go, but I wouldn't. He wouldn't want me to like go and play with the kids straight away. He'd be like, sit next to me, chill mm. with the adults. And obviously I'm bored and I think, why do I want to be here? Like, I want to go play. But it then became a thing that I, 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 have, a, I have no problem now sitting with older people, people that apparently we have nothing in common. But you're a walking library. There's, there's things I can learn from you if I just humble myself and try and understand, see from your eyes. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank Just, you. Um, I know we've got one question from D left. Does anyone get any other questions at all? No, D, do you want to ask your question? I should have several. I'm going to start with uh, one that I know you work alongside uh, in Mali and Nigeria specifically, there's a lot of international NGOs in Mali, and perhaps there's a lot of um, Chinese construction companies in that have a strong presence in Africa. How are you able to set your project and approach and differentiate it from these current entities there? <laughs> yeah. Basically, when we leave, there's skills transferable skill sets. <laughs> we don't leave you with just a Lego kit um, and then we're gone. It's almost like coming in like an alien. Okay, we're gonna take, we're gonna take some people or we're gonna drop some stuff and we're gonna leave you. We're, we're, it, no, it doesn't work like that. It shouldn't work like that. If, if you do have a transferable skill set, get to know the people. And I think it's interesting that you talked about um, the Chinese investment because I, I, I know that the culture and the way um, they they operate, it's with respect and it's with the succession and preservation of their culture and their bottom line. But, you know, I think there needs to be a bit of a give because obviously they're the higher, they're the, the stronger 
or the guys with all the the might and and the implementation and so no one's really gonna question if you're coming in with all the ideas all the resources and the it's great but then empower the people is 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 the thing and so that that's what creates the difference because most projects do not and even it i think even if they say they empower i would like to see projects that we would be able to track that for the net for 50 years like for instance i think um the life cycle of a building they is like maybe 60 or 70 years with an extension of 120 years cycle to change or how do you then create a modular building out of this and so what would need to be seen is how these projects then um imp continuously empower the people for the next 50 years if you're not doing that if your project doesn't do that if your project doesn't seek to do that then you're chatting shit to me <laughs> Um, it yeah. doesn't make sense, yeah. And then you already answered my question, but I would never ask this of another architectural project, but I, did you have a built-in follow-up plan to measure the long-term impact of this project? Well, yeah, the built, um, it would be to track how, for instance, so that it was the statistics on the soil, the fishing, the water, building up those statistics, tracking them every year, tracking to see, um, tracking them at different locations to see like what the, um, the impacts of upstream is happening downstream. Obviously this is a lot of traveling that needs to be done and you need to actually start creating your networks within these areas. And sometimes the data isn't, the data isn't necessarily available. And, but rather than running away from that, build it, just, just build the infrastructure. I think, when it comes to Africa or when it comes to creating data that supports Africa, I think we need to get to a point where we get out of our ass and just understand that certain things don't work. They don't work because they either A, hasn't, have never worked, or B, um, it wasn't applicable to the communities that we were trying to make them work in. The minute you start looking at it like that, I think it would be easier to start tracking those things. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, though. Oh, absolutely. Um, it seems like your heritage has a strong role in your work style and approach. I don't know, you, could you elaborate more on that? Um, my work style um, and approach is very, it, almost informal. I think just by the way, the same way I interact with you guys is the same way I'd I'd work with my team or the local community. It's from a space of, I'm not trying to, it's from a space of, I know nothing. I know nothing, I wanna learn. And yeah, I just keep asking questions. I think in a day and time we're in, being an ego, being an ego, yes, being an ego and being egotistical should be equated to uh, being a colonialist. And so if we don't wanna have that mentality where I don't understand what you're doing. I don't really care what you're doing, but we have a great idea. Hey, take it. No, really take it. No, no, I swear, take it. If we can't get out of that, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not interested. So I, yeah, I just, I just cut through the noise. I'm not, I'm not interested in the political hoo-ha. I'm not interested in us you may making it sound sweet. Like, the world is on fire. I don't think we have time anymore. I, I don't have patience for it. So true. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> on that note um, I think it's important that we just give everybody to come off mute and give Renata a round of applause. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> Yeah, can you be my friend? Is that a amazing? I am, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? All your friends. It don't matter. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am an explorer, and that's what I do. And yeah. Renata, can yeah. I um, ask? So at the moment, I found a couple of links to your um, your website, your podcast. Um, could you please enter your um, whichever social media channel you feel comfortable in sharing? um so people can contact you if you're open to that and is there anything that you're working on that people can support 
um, tell a friend about or even contribute to as, um, or even maybe uh, use as an example as they're building their own work? Um, yeah, cool. Uh, so I have Studio RDNX, which is on Instagram. Um, you can also oh, type, it, type it, type it, right. <laughs> Give me a sec. <laughs> um, right. New message. No. I put a couple in there, but I wasn't sure if those were all of them. I can't even see the message thing on my thing. Okay, well, you can tell me and I can write it in. So Studio RDNX. Yeah. Um, um, it's podcast um, musings behind the creative yes the podcast if you go to studio rdnx um on instagram all the pods are in the link tree um let me see if i can help be more if you stop sharing screen you'll be able to get your menu back up um right so studio rdnx So yeah, just uh, very quickly, um, yes, I am working on a couple of things. So I do have musings behind the creative, which was pretty much um, me trying to understand who I was as a uh, designer and as, you know, what, what is my place in the world? So um and then asking other people about their practice and just seeing what you're doing, what works, talking about our internal um, struggles, because I tend to find that, you know, it's, especially for black creatives, it seems to be a little bit harder to kind of just have safe spaces to just talk about everything that's happening and what we're doing um, without it being like, oh yeah, so, no, that's not a problem. That's that's normal. Or you're making a big deal out of this. <laughs> so there's that. Um, and then I am in the process of trying to set up in Nigeria um, a working base for creatives who are very tactile, um, are artisans who work with their hands. Because my interests are from metal, um, metal works to weaving, sewing. Um, I will try a bit of everything and it's been part of my practice. And so I want to create a, like a home, um, a home and a home collection for, um, that it literally takes the different styles of each culture and creates a home collection about um, from that. Um, my love for this is because my first job was in Selfridges and then all I ever did was high-end retail. But again, it was always everybody else's faces on it. And that's great, but you know, I just wanted more. That's I think that's, that's, um, that's a great example of, uh, of a mission that's being developed. I think our, um, Studio RDNX is a good example. So everybody, please um, log on to that, follow it, see what's going on. We have to wrap up now. Um, so um, Madge, feel free to start recording and, You've got all the contact details.